Hello, my name is Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz. Uh, I'm happy to share with you this uh, video on preparation of complex and simple porcelain onlays. And onlay preparations, fortunately, are not as complicated as gold onlay preparations. We all remember in dental school learning the complexities of an onlay preparation with all this axial, uh, the perfect axial, axial angulations, offsets, shoulders, etc. And those were necessary because of mechanical retention. We, we needed that in order for the restoration to be able to stay in the mouth. We live in a different time. We have different materials. Adhesion is the way, uh, is the way of the future. The, the restorations, porcelain onlys, will be bonded with adhesive. So no longer do we need mechanical retention. And that really simplifies the preparation very dramatically. And it and not only simplifies the preparation, it also allows us to preserve a lot of tooth. So when we're going to prepare our onlay, we're going to use a, a very simple admarmentarium. You know, at the LA Institute, we have a bird block that is a, a, an all-purpose bird block. We don't need too many instruments. And, you know, when you when you practice on a on a... On a regular practice, you don't want to have endless amount of bird blocks and instruments because that just makes life a lot more complicated. So uh, we have a bird block that, that, that does all what we need to do. And using this burst, I'm going to share with you the steps. Um, the first step to make things very, very simple is to do a full, to do an occlusal reduction. So that's usually going to be my first step. Sometimes we may choose to remove the old restoration first, but by quite honestly, my preferred approach is to do occlusal reduction, restoration, and all. So we're going to do uh, the occlusal reduction, and to do that, we're going to use a, a a fatter burr, the diamond. It is the 1856-025 from Brassler. This, uh, at the tip of this diamond is 1.8 and the middle of the shaft is two millimeters. So we, our preparation, you know, will go from 1.5 to two millimeters. 1.5 would be for, for um, Emacs. Two millimeters would be more for like pressable material like Empress or CCR uh, press from, from um, Carrare. So it depends what material we're going to use. With 1.5 to 2 millimeters, it would be, uh, you know, the reduction that we will be doing. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do depth cuts in order to, to, you know, to be able to be as accurate as possible on our occlusal reduction. So we're going to, basically, we're going to follow the angulation of the tooth. After we do the occlusal reduction, that will, brings inter will bring us interproximally to just just about the contact point. And what I like to use at that particular point to clean out that contact area, as you see on the picture on the right, I like to use a thinner burr. Usually I use my veneer burr, there's also on the kit, to clean up that proximal, being careful not to, of course, damage the adjacent tooth. After that, I will break the contact ever so slightly using a mosquito burr. As you can see on this preparation, there is no boxes. Boxes are remnant of GB Black, and GB Black is history when it comes to uh, adhesive restorations. Me boxes are necessary for mechanical retention. They are not necessary if we're going to be bonding our restoration. Now, if I was going to do an, uh, a zirconia onlay, which I do occasionally, rarely, but you know, if I was going to do a zirconia onlay, then I would be definitely putting a little box there because zirconia is very is, is not very predictable to bond zirconia. Uh, and and believe it or not, the preparation at this point, once you once you do your your you know breaking the contact, the, the only thing left to be to do is to do the, the a, a bevel, a nice deep bevel in the facial. Only on the aesthetic part. You can see in the picture uh, on the middle picture, you can see a nice bevel that actually included uh, that that little class, uh, that little facial silver filling, and uh, the bevel, as you can see, is is is, is on enamel. We don't want to go. We don't want to get too deep. But the purpose of the bevel is to give us a better transition between the restoration and 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 the tooth. 
Uh, if you look, take a look at the lingual surface, you will see that there is no bevel. It's basically a butt margin. So, um, and, and of course, proximally, we're talking about the same thing, a butt margin. If you take a look also, um, distal mesially, the, we, I have bro uh, broken the contact ever so slightly with the mosquito burr. Uh, we, we didn't make, we didn't create a, a big separation, just a tiny separation, just sufficient for the laboratory to be able to, uh, to, to see the separation and to create a restoration that's going to be beautiful and is going to be very clearly established. So the general rules for onlet preparation is, uh, very important to stay super gingival. And that is one of the most important rules. Uh, when it comes to, to adhesive dentistry. The moment you go subgingival, you, you know, the cementation, the impression, everything is going to be, become more difficult. Of course, the health of the patient's gingival will be more compromised. Everything will just go downhill. Staying above the gum is always the goal. Uh, rounded angles, we don't want sharp angles anywhere on the preparation. Uh, Preserving enamel is such a desirable thing, and, and we're going to talk about that. Right now, we're, we're basically talking about a, a, a basic preparation. Again, 1.5 reduction. On the transitional areas, if you look at your, of your picture on the top, you will see that, that this particular preparation is a combination inlay-onlay. Uh, and that in the isthmus, where, where the, the inlay portion, the isthmus is, breaks into the into the onlay section, you want to have at least two millimeters. You definitely, in any of those transitional areas, you need two millimeters. You don't want to, you don't want to be too thin because that's where they break. Now, full coverage onlay, in fact, mechanically is more desirable. But of course, if that's the case, then you end up sacrificing maybe healthy cusp. So it's your decision. I mean, you need to make a decision w which direction you would like to go. I personally tend to do a lot of combination inlay onlays. But uh, in case of doubt, cover the, cover the cusp. In case that you think the cusp may be not strong enough, cover them. Because you, the worst thing that can happen is you do an, uh, uh, an inlay, then a cusp breaks, and now the, 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 the whole thing is, is, is damaged. And then, of course, when possible, you want to keep the restoration under, under compressive forces. Any axial reduction leads, leads to shear forces. So when we are, when, so when we stay, you know, when we do occlusal reduction and we avoid axial reductions, we are mechanically much more sound. So now I want to share with you a, a, a nice video that will show you the steps of a simple preparation. And uh, you see right there, what I'm going to do right now is you're seeing me do a, you know, using that, that the thicker burr, the occlusal reduction burr, you see me do depth cuts. And I find depth cuts to be very, very useful. And of course, cutting plastic teeth are kind of funny. It's, 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 it's actually it's easier to cut natural teeth. What you see me do right there is to do occl an occ occlusal reduction. I'm trying to uh, remove the, you know, remove a, an even amount around the, the occlusal surface. So we're going to, we're, now we're going to continue to reduce. We're gonna carry that as close to the proximal as possible, being careful not to damage the adjacent tooth. By the way, if you wanna protect your adjacent tooth, uh, some people prefer to use a, a, like a wedge guard or, or like one of those wedges that, that protect the adjacent tooth, that, that would be an optional you know, situation and, and it would definitely protect your adjacent tooth. So I carry my reduction as close to the to the proximal tooth as possible. I want to make sure that that is there is a a two millimeter reduction right there. Then we're gonna do the facial reduction. It's gonna be exactly the same thing. We're gonna sink it all the way in. It's gonna be a two millimeter reduction, and uh, because it's plastic, you see that it kind of it kind of burns a little bit. Of course, it, that won't happen with your natural tooth. So we we continue to do occlusal reduction. Um, again, we're trying to carry it as close to the proximal tooth as possible without damaging the adjacent tooth. Now, what we, as you can see, what I'm doing is I'm using that, that still the occlusal reduction burr and I'm doing 
refining the occlusal reduction on the proximal area. I'm making sure that I have at least one and a half to two millimeters of occlusal reduction in that proximal area. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a slight breaking of the contact. When I do a two millimeter reduction, I'm going to, I'm going to get the, I'm going to get the, the con, usually that, the margin is going to be right slightly below the contact. What I'm using right now is a, is a, a, a little tiny, um, mosquito burr that is breaking the contact. And as soon as I take the wedge out, you're going to see how it looks. You see how there's slight separation right there. Now we're going to do the same thing on the distal side. Now that only works if is if you bring the the margin of that occlus the proximal area if you bring it just just right before it breaks but right before the contact breaks if you if your tooth is still under a, in a lot of contact and you try to and you try to bring the mosquito burr it's going to be very very difficult so make sure that you drop that proximal margin sufficiently to be close to breaking contact, but not quite breaking contact. So now once you do this, then you go back with your, with your diamond, with your, maybe you, this time I like to use a thinner diamond. I like to use the veneer diamond to do that facial reduction. And you can see yeah, that, that facial bevel. And you see, my intention is to do a bevel that is about two to three millimeters in thickness. Um, and and, it's, and it, the goal is to keep it within enamel. We don't, I don't wanna make such a, so much reduction that it, it goes into dentin because the goal is that, that that's going to be, that's all gonna be in, in enamel. So when the porcelain gets bonded to the enamel, it's gonna be ideal. So what I'm doing right there is I'm just taking the sliver soft making sure that it's nice and clean, make sure that, that, that you're you know very accurate on your on your movement so you don't damage the adjacent tooth. If you, of course if you happen to damage the adjacent tooth you would you would go and polish it off. Uh, you could use the, the wedge guard to protect everything. And uh, pretty much we're getting done to finishing that preparation. A lot of times I go back with a little soft flex disc and and uh, and just just smooth up all the edges. I don't want to have any any uh, enamel slivers hanging around or or um, I want everything to look very nice and very nice and smooth that, that it makes a big big difference to, to you know to the final result so now we're going to now we're um, just cleaning it up a little bit not not that much and uh, the last thing will be to bring the soft flex disc and then just give it a quick pass you can see we do, do go with a soft flex disc right there, cleaning it up. The soft flex disc is just gonna get rid of the 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 tiny bit of uneven, you know, enamel, and then that's it. Now we're gonna talk about a slightly more complicated situation. We're now we're gonna I'm gonna share with you a preparation that is more difficult, and this is where really uh, it requires or we require that. We understand the five rules of super gingival preparations, and uh, and I will share those with you right now. So the first rule is really very simple: be careful when removing all restorations and caries close to the gingiva. It, this this sounds so simple and so logical, but believe me, is very important. Well, don't don't underestimate the power of music magnification and being very careful when we're removing caries close to the gum. As you can see on this picture, you could have you could have quite easily believed that that with the, this caries and the size of this caries, you would have gone deep below the gum. And if you if you have that in your mind and you start prepping, you're going to go below the gum. And as you can see, after all caries was removed. Uh, I was able to stay above the gum. I have a, still a periphery of enamel, and uh, and and it really, my experience has been very much like that. Often you 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 start thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to go deep below the gum, and if you're careful, you end up in situations similar to this one right here, where I preserve 
the the you know I, I stayed above the gum and then everything is a lot easier when your margins are above the gum now the the technique number two the super gingival technique number two is no boxes and this is basically a continuation of what we were talking about before because now that we understand that that the, all the retention is going to happen due to adhesion and not to mechanical retention boxes are necessary so it's very important please take a look at after this photographs right here are depicted they're showing the after the occlusal reduction has been achieved interproximally as well if you see after the two millimeter millimeter and a half or two millimeter reduction now we're we are just about to break contact but we're still in contact with the adjacent tooth and usually that's what i see I see that they were almost ready to break contact, but, but the tooth is still, is still touching the adjacent tooth. Traditionally, we would have kept dropping the box or dropping the margin until we break contact. What is the disadvantage of that? That in the real world, the more you drop the margin, the, more, the closer you get to the gum, the more chances you are to be subgingival. So instead of that, once I get close to breaking the contact, once I have enough occlusal space for my restoration then instead of keep dropping the box what I will do is I will use either a metal strip which is pretty difficult in the posterior area of the mouth although there are some some um, some nice strips that, that have handles uh, Brasslet makes one of those uh, other companies make also strips with handles so you could do that like a metal strip or, the, or, which is my favorite option, would be to use a mosquito burr. And what I will do is, as you, as you saw in the previous video, I will put a wedge guard, a, a little wedge that has a protection for my adjacent tooth, and I will pass the mosquito burr right in, in the contact area, and it just breaks that contact in seconds. And you, see, you saw that before, you will see that again on, on our following video. And it's, it's actually quite simple to do. And it preserves, you know, everything super gingival interproximally. So no boxes because boxes are unnecessary. You see that the separation is ever so slightly. I don't need huge separation. I just need enough separation. Now keep in mind that you do want to, you do want to pay attention to the draw. If your proximal margin is kind of under the, the adjacent tooth, and you see that your restoration is not going to have a draw to go in, then you may have to alter the adjacent tooth. If it's a little, so if it's a little bulbous, you can uh, you can uh, adjust the contact on the adjacent tooth. So uh, you see right there, kind of like you know, uh, a mistake. This is this is a mistake where where if we if we don't do sufficient ax a reduction, occlusal reduction interproximally, we end up having. Uh, making it very difficult for the laboratory to fabricate the restoration. So that picture right here shows uh, an improperly prepped onlay. The mesial portion of that onlay, as you can see, had a sufficient occlusal reduction. It created the, 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 the contact was broken right below the contact point, and the laboratory was able to fabricate the mesial part of that onlay correctly. If you take a look at the distal part of the onlay, the preparation was, the occlusal reduction was insufficient. Then, uh, then uh, our colleague here broke contact, uh, and but but did not give the laboratory enough space to to uh, to build that contact area. And now we're going to have a restoration that's going to have very weird uh, shape. So. Uh, the the black line shows where the reduction should have gone, how far apically that reduction should have gone. So uh, one more millimeter of reduction proximally would have give us would have given us the right proximal shape. Now the following technique, technique number three, it's actually a paradigm shift. So if you see your picture on the on the left on your left. You will see that in this particular tooth, I have already removed uh, caries, a great deal of caries. I've already done my occlusal reduction, and now I have my, my enamel margin is basically at gum level. 
The enamel looks healthy. As you can see, it's transparent. It looks nice and healthy. But when I tested the, the dentin, I realized that the dentin still carries. It's still soft, still infected with bacteria. That means that I need to keep cleaning that dentin. Now, if I use traditional techniques, I would have go ahead and remove the enamel because remember in school we learned that, that we should never preserve enamel without dentinal support. What would have happened? Immediately I would have ended up having deep subgingival margins. But instead of that, understanding the benefits of adhesive dentistry and how bonded composite will reinforce a full thickness of enamel, I preserve that, that full thickness of enamel, carefully re remove caries, and then after that, repair that enamel. You can see right there how the enamel has been properly repaired with composite, nicely bonded composite. Now, that allows me to preserve my margin just about at the gum level, not have to drop my margin, preserve my enamel so I have my enamel seal, from here, I will take my final impression and my restoration will be cemented on this complex, composite and enamel complex. It will protect, preserve, reinforce. So this thing, I've been using this technique for many years and it works phenomenally well. Uh, this is basically understanding our materials and using our materials for our benefit. The following technique is technique number four and that's margin elevation. Margin elevation is, is a, 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 the next level when you have a margin that in fact is below the gum and you know that if you prep below the gum and you leave your margin below the gum and then you provisionalize, you know what's going to happen. You're going to have a nightmare of a situation the day of the cementation. And that, that tends to be a big problem. Like right here you can see the consequences of doing that. This is in fact a a dentist who came to my office asking me to, to cement an onlay that she had had cemented by another colleague three times and the onlay kept falling off. And guess why? Why do you think it kept falling off? Because the margin was below the gum, uh, a good two millimeters. Uh, trying to control the bleeding in that situation becomes incredibly difficult that, you know, you're, you're applying your bonding, your, your etch, your bonding, you're just about ready to see the restoration and the gum starts bleeding. It is a very difficult situation. So that's why the enamel elevation or the, the margin elevation techniques were developed. Uh, we, we will place a matrix band right there. We will use double wedge techniques so that we can really isolate that, isolate that margin. And then we can elevate our margin appropriately. Right there you can see... Uh, one example using a, a you know traditional tougher myo matrix band right there another one you can see the garrison um, ring being used for the same purpose. The intention is that we're gonna bring the margin that was below the gum. We're gonna bring it to just our, above the gum, and we're gonna take our impression. Now this picture shows you the be the before and after before uh, you know preparation after the preparation we have elevated the margin now from there we can take our impression it's going to be a piece of cake to take an impression from there is going to be a piece of cake to cement our onlay and this is going to do very very well this onlay is going to protect the tooth which is damaged because once we bond that onlay on top of that tooth that's going to reinforce the tooth it's going to keep everything together and uh, it, it, it works very very well so um, that's technique number four. This is a, an, another example of the same situation, a very extreme example where we have a very, on tooth number 15 or the second molar on the maxilla, we have a very deep subgingival caries. Uh, we, we're gonna, in this particular case, one more time, we're gonna use that, that technique, that, that margin elevation technique. Um, you can see right there that, that after the margin elevation and, and very important, if we're going to use this margin elevation technique, we need to make sure that we take an x-ray before we take the impression because you never want to have margin elevation and have, have an open margin on your, on your, you know, 
on your buildup or your margin elevation procedure, you want to make sure that it looks beautiful, nicely sealed, because that is going to support your final restoration. So uh, after that, we take an impression. We're going to inform the patient that this is a little bit of a, you know, this is a compromise. Of course, ideally, we wish that the patient would have brought us a a restoration that was, I mean, a tooth that wasn't so badly damaged. Uh, the patient brought us a, a, tooth, a tooth that was pretty badly damaged, and now we're trying to be heroic and save it. And this is one of the options that we have to do. And then right there, you can see the the clinical photograph after the margin elevation. I will take an impression from there, and then you can see uh, the cemented restoration uh, with two two margins. One, you know, below the gum that is you know with composite, and the one you know two millimeters above that that is porcelain. And those restorations do very very well. I've done many many of these restorations and, and they, it works really good you always need to let the patient know that this is a compromise I mean anytime you have a margin that deep below the gum it's, it's going to be difficult whether you're using traditional crown or you're doing uh, crown lengthening or you know whichever technique you decide to do to manage this particular problem is going to be complicated and the patient should know that and and you, you need to give the patient, you need to get an informed consent from the patient so they understand what they're getting. Now, I want to share with you the, a difficult situation. So this is the video of a tooth that has lots of caries. This is, this is going to be a, a, a complicated preparation. The, but nevertheless, the technique is still the same. We're still going to do occlusal reduction first. We are going to sink a burr fully, and then we're going to start, uh, you know, extending and, and extending that reduction mesio and distally. Make sure that it's consistent. That the the reduction on the cusp on the slopes is the two the 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 full one and a half or two millimeters. And again, remember, I, as I said before. It would be one and a half if it was Emax. It would be two millimeters if it's uh, if it's pressable. Um, so and usually interproximally, I would say in the mesial and distal tends to be more towards the two millimeters than the one and a half. Uh, one more time, we're sinking that that burr fully right there. If we sink the burr fully, we're basically prepping about 1.8 uh, a 1.8 reduction. So we're sinking it all the way, and then we're going to join all the all the uh, the dip cuts together. That will give us our even reduction. And as you see right there, we just you know, nicely bring it into the proximal area. We want to do it carefully so not damage that adjacent tooth. Now we're doing the, the distal part, bringing it as close to the proximal area as possible. Of course, you're always you you can always grab a one of those uh, wedge guards and protect your adjacent tooth if you're if you're concerned about damaging the adjacent tooth. So after I did you know that on after I did the full occlusal reduction, I I tend to start then I start removing my caries and in this particular tooth, all all the all the black that you see right there in the middle of the tooth, all of that is fake caries so we remove a ton of caries as you can see right there and um, this would be a pretty rotten tooth or maybe a tooth that had a huge amalgam or a huge composite that has failed and now we're we continue to remove the caries as you can see the facial cusp is pretty badly undermined uh, the the proximal area is, is pretty deep interproximally. The caries goes very, very deep. Uh, and this, this is a case where we were almost below the gum. Uh, but if we are very, very cautious, we can possibly preserve the margin just barely super gingival. In case the, the in case that the margin in fact goes below the gum, we may consider doing a margin elevation procedure. Now, in this particular case, uh, you know, we were able to to could carefully remove the the caries in the cervical area and not go below the gum. 
So if we don't go below the gum or if we're just about gum level or maybe less than a half a millimeter below the gingiva, I will, do, I will not do a margin elevation. If I'm half a millimeter below the gingiva, I tend to just, uh, it's easy to manage when the margin is less than half a millimeter below the gingiva. It becomes very difficult as we get deeper and deeper in, in the gingiva. So con we continue to remove the caries. This is again a pretty rotten tooth. And, um, and as you can see, the tooth gets less and less. Now the distal part of the tooth, like in most of our situations, you have what part of the tooth that is badly damaged, but you have part of the tooth that is pretty healthy. But why should we damage the healthy part of the tooth? Why should we destroy the healthy part of the tooth with a crown? Save that healthy part of the tooth. Repair the caries. You see how I'm continue to, I'm continue to undermine the, 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 the buccal cusp. And, um, you know, the, the, the enamel is pretty complete. But now we're almost, we almost have, uh, you know, the, the, the mesial buccal cusp with a, a full thickness of enamel, but almost no dentin so to support it. Uh, so now, of course, what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to repair that weakened, that weakened area. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we want to make sure we have a full thickness of enamel, that the enamel looks healthy and it's not fractured, that everything is, is, is nice and, and complete. That being the case, then now we're going to go ahead and, and you know, finish up our distal area, carefully continue to to do our occlusal reduction interproximally. We want close to two millimeters interproximally. And that will that will leave that will leave us with just ever so slight uh, contact proximally. And of course we're going to we're gonna break that contact interproximally using our mosquito our mosquito burr. So now we're 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 fine tuning, get rid of some of the 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 sharp edges. Now we bring in our our wedge guard, and then we're gonna bring the mosquito burr, and the mosquito burr is just 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 we barely going to touch interproximally. We're gonna just barely break the contact. You can see right there. Usually it's about one or two passes, and uh, and then. When when I take that that wedge out, you will see slight the proper slight separation that we need to have interproximally, so the laboratory will be able to fabricate your only with with nice with nice margins. I am you know I often will do the the breaking of the contact without a wedge, and I'm I'm very cautious to try not to damage the adjacent tooth. If I happen to shave a tiny bit of the adjacent tooth, I will go back with a soft flex disc and and um, and and polish it, polish it very very well. Now, as you saw, I I apply bonding, you know, to to the to the weakened area, and now with a little composite, I'm gonna go ahead and repair those little undercuts, repair the cusp. So now we're gonna, re, you know. I could use restorative composite as well. In this particular case, I chose to just use a little flowable to repair that interproximal, that those undercuts. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't always, you know, w I won't, don't always repair it. But if my, but my enamel is pretty weak, then I definitely want to repair it. And after applying some flowable there, I, and I when when I use, if I'm going to use flowable, I'm going to use the really good quality flowable. The one that is highly fi filled, like uh, Majesty from Carrara, which is 80% uh, filled, or even uh, material like like uh, Grandioso Flow, which is even more uh, even more filled, like 83% filled. So I want material that is highly filled. And then after doing that little repair of the Nemo, now I'm just finishing the preparation. Making sure that everything's smooth, that all the margins, all the there's no sharp angles. There's there's uh, the the margins all flow, con you know, continually flow nicely, and um, you know, creating making sure that the interproximally there's there's no undercuts, and um, so this is 
basically, I mean, it, this preparation usually takes me, even a complicated preparation like this one, usually takes me 10 minutes or something like that. If it's a simple prep, I mean, literally an online prep is probably like a five minute type of thing. And and we're not talking about doing a, a, a poor quality preparation. We're talking about very well done preparation. The, 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 the key is, the, the technique is that, you know, only preparations are simpler. And, um, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to make it, we don't need to over overcomplicate this technique. Now you see me do the bevel. Now again, I want a, a, at least a two millimeter bevel, maybe three millimeter bevel. And if you see, I'm, I'm gonna stay with an enamel. I wanna make sure that, the, the you know, the, the dot bevel is fully on enamel. I'm not concerned about the porcelain being thin there because it's going to be bonded to 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 enamel and and quite honestly that I I find that those preparations you know they I've never seen those those margins break. Well, that was a simple preparation as you can see and of course also a complex preparation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for watching and until the next time.